I was uh, I was born in Champaign, Illinois, uh, where my father was doing graduate work at the time at the university. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh and left uh, when I graduated high school to do undergraduate work at Goddard College in Plainfield. And it was uh, it was a, it was just enormous. It was a, it was a great, enormously fortunate move that I made um, going to Goddard and um, because it probably saved my life. Um, and um, I've pretty much stayed in New England ever since. Although I have been, uh, I have been spending some time in State College, Pennsylvania over the last couple of years, sort of bouncing back and forth. Um, I studied it. I studied at Goddard or writing uh, studio art and um, literature. I did um, some poetry workshops in New York City for a brief period of time at the New School, and I did some graduate work at uh, the MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson College, which I hasten to say I did not graduate from. Um, but uh, I have been enormously fortunate uh, during, that was in the mid '80s that I was at Warren Wilson. I was I've been enormously fortunate in my life to have had some mind-bogglingly good mentors and teachers over those years. And um, one of the things that I like to do when I read is actually begin with a poem by somebody else. And I'd like to start with a poem uh, from uh, by Barry Goldenson who passed away unfortunately uh, i actually i was just at uh, just in a matter of a few days ago i was at a wonderful memorial for barry uh that was uh, held in callus and um it was it was fantastic i got to see a lot of people many of whom i hadn't seen probably in 50 years um but barry was one of the people that i worked with at goddard as an undergraduate and so I'd like to just pay respects to him by reading, by starting off with a very short poem of his from a very old book of his um, called uh, St. Venus Eve. Uh, this poem is called, The Poem is What It's Like Here. Can everybody hear me okay? The poem is what it's like here. The thing said, voices, human voices, messages. I have a message for you, sir, from someone not here, for you. What it feels like to be here, there, the cold slap of air thinning the smell of the Black River, skimming birds that turn and vanish over the dense banks into the glare, you, gone. Um, and remind me, Stephen, how much time do I have to, for my part of this? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, what I would like to do, uh, if no one objects is I want to start with newer stuff and, uh, I'll read some poems from the book, uh, sort of toward the end, <clears throat> but, um, I'd like to start with some newer things. Some of these have been accepted uh, already at journals. Uh, one or two have already appeared online, um, and some of them are still sort of looking for homes. But none of these poems have been collected in a book or a chapbook. And uh, a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them are going to be in this uh, form, this nonce form, as the saying goes. Uh, that I came up with, um, which is, uh, well, the simplest way to describe it is they're 100 word poems. There are 10 lines of 10 words each. And the title 
of each poem is usually just the first few words of the first line. Everything had to be invented. Everything had to be invented. Coffee. Porch awnings. Grieving. The fine golden hairs on your forearm. Salmon. What was the order they arrived in, all of the things? No one knows. No one knows the order or what decreed them to be so. All we know is that there had to be things. And so they became. The things did not need names, it was thought, but words had been one of the inventions. What did the words do but have this insatiable need to attach to things? The words insatiable need, for example. Assault weapon, dog collar, crescent moon. Uh, also, please interrupt me at any time, anybody, if I'm A, going too fast, or for some reason I'm not, uh, you can't hear me. A fire burned brightly. A fire burned brightly as out of the fire another fire burned, giving birth to another fire, a small green fire that a child could hold in the palm of the hand. This fire fed on human grievances. It gave no heat. How long before it extinguishes itself? Tens of thousands of years? Perhaps never, for when is the end of human grievance? Animals and birds have been seen to shed tears in its light. It is good to come to the conclusion of one's life and realize that your grievances have been released, the panther weeping before the blaze. The Juniata's waters. Um, the Juniata is a river in central Pennsylvania. The Juniata's waters are high, and the dog runs far ahead of us clearly engaged in sniffing out the awakening groundhogs. Here is the first forsythia in full bloom I have seen this season. We each have a small umbrella to ward off the occasional raindrops that we can see making linked rings on the river's silken surface. As we walk, you put out your hand, and I take it in mine. I am about to say, I love you when you point across the water and I see the slow beating of a heron's wings making for the opposite shoal. I am so happy because... I am so happy because you told me you slept well last night. I had to ask, since I am here and you are there and I could not have touched you last night if I had wanted to, and I did want to. I won't count the times I've put my arms around you because to begin counting means at some point to reach an end, and I cannot bear the thought of the end of holding you. I imagine a lesser God, the maker of the list of last things, his quill pen poised over the parchment, waiting. <laughs> I've often wondered. I've often wondered if over time I have kissed every square inch of your body. It troubles me to think that there might be even the smallest portion of you my lips have not honored. I imagine you giving off a steady telltale glow, a saffron iridescence, any place my mouth has come in contact with you, making it easier to isolate and identify those minute segments that have suffered from my unintended neglect. There, an unlit spot the size of an 11 point lowercase o between the third and fourth toes of your left foot. Hungrily, gratefully, I lift your lustrous ankle. <laughs>
You opened me. You opened me with your lips, your hands, your intuition, in service of the heart as much as pleasure, those two facing pages from the same book. The evening skies opening for the moon. It had been a long time since I had felt such awakenings. The density of light in concomitant shadow. More than a thing broken being made whole again. A replenishment. The way house plants that have been neglected accept the offering of water. Not a new thing, but the essential thing done in a new way. All the incertitude in me set free by your rapturous eyes. How we doing? He wants to tell her. He wants to tell her, don't worry about anything. All will be well. Can she believe that? Maybe. More likely, she'll at least believe the possibility that all could be well and worry anyway. This is what living with non-objective anxiety is about. He remembers those lines people in recovery keep repeating. Everything will be okay in the end, and if things aren't okay, it's not the end. And most things I worry about never happen. Still, it never stopped anyone from worrying, did it? He holds her, and she begins to calm herself in his arms. Not the end. Sort of a companion piece to that one. There was a moment. There was a moment when he realized that all would be well. At dawn, the sun's benevolence set the petals of the new snowdrops ablaze. The room was clean, slowly being filled with a growing brightness, and in the center of the room, a table, and on the table, a clear glass vase, and beside the vase, a pitcher of water. Everything seemed to be quietly waiting, as he was waiting, as we all are waiting, from breath to breath for the thing to join us in the room and show the vase and reassure us that all is well. Um, another one of Barry's, Barry Goldson's students, uh, a guy who preceded me at Goddard, so it would have been in the late 60s, It's a wonderful Vermont poet, uh, named Norman Doobie. Uh, Norman Doobie passed away um, not that long ago, and uh, this poem is for him. I unfortunately never had the opportunity to meet Norman, but uh, I certainly heard a lot about him from people who did know him. He taught at uh, Arizona State, I think, for many, many years. And uh, I think in the eyes of, well, quite a few people, I know Sidney Lee would be one, um, you know, sui generi, as the saying goes. I mean, he was brilliant and really unique guy and really unique poems. Um, so check out Norman's work. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby. This poem, also, I should say, Norman was a dedicated Zen Buddhist and meditator. And that fact uh, figures into the poem. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby. And oh, the word zazen in here, if, the, if you don't know what zazen is, it, it means sitting meditation. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby begins like every poem with silence not the silence of the instant before the meditation bell is struck, but the silence the gong of the meditation bell rides upon into our ears as we sit zazen wondering 
when is dinner for fuck's sake i'm starving thinking i'd do anything for a cigarette right now the body flies off our bones which become meal for the earth do be said mark strand was asked if he wanted to still be read after he died he replied i'd rather be alive after i die <laughs> And I'll do uh, a few more newer ones. Now I'll read some poems from the book. This is called You Hear Voices. You hear voices. They all say versions of the same thing. You have not done enough with what you have. You don't contest or argue the accusation. In your own view, they are stating a truth you yourself have known many years if not for most of your life. Always, it seemed, for as long as you could remember, not your wound is your gift, but merely a wound. Because you have this misperception so many of us share, confusing talent and ambition with purpose. Because the voices are really saying, with what you have, you have not loved enough. I don't know why. I don't know why the human heart seeks so avidly what it cannot have. All an animal wants is to eat when hungry, reproduce, feed its young, and, if it works out, feed itself again when hungry. Protect itself and the young from being harmed by other things, some of them living, some not. None of this, where is my larger den and brighter and warmer fires and the secret to living forever? And then more and more. What I had thought of as a child was the curse of being human. So much more gracious to be anything else. When there is nowhere left. When there is nowhere left to run, that is the time to stop running. When no place to hide, stand tall in the middle of the room. Why wouldn't you wonder when and how you will die? Nothing could be more human. I waited my whole life for this, I think to myself without a trace of irony. But the joke is on you, reader, my old friend, old confederate, because it's love. It's love I've waited a lifetime for, and here it is. The world always becomes a sweeter place, a realm of possibility, when we set aside expectations. I'm going to break away from that form and read a couple of other things that are newer, um, which are sort of in more standard lineation, and also a couple of prose poems. I don't know if this is a poem, but this is very new, and I did I wanted to read it. Um, it's about my father. I mentioned that I was born in Champaign, Illinois, when my dad was doing graduate work. He had a, a career in the English department at the University of Pittsburgh that lasted almost 40 years. And um, he was an incredible writer. He was a fiction writer, short stories. And he was also a drunk. And um, so this is a piece of prose. I don't know if it's a poem or not, but uh, this is about my dad. My father, knowing his mind was not right, was only angered by one thing, that we had decided his driving privileges needed to be taken away. In this city, his city, the city where he had spent his entire life. At that point, he had not yet told anyone 
about the time when he had gone out to get some groceries at the supermarket where he had always shopped. And after roaming the market's aisles and checking things off his list and finding nearly everything on the list, had pushed the grocery cart with his purchases to his car and transferred the bags from the cart to the back seat and then returned the cart to the corral in the parking lot and went back to his car and turned the key in the ignition and sat there, the motor idling, trying to recall what it was you did next. Not the act of remembering where his apartment was and the route he needed to take to get there, but of a deeper, more profound unknowing. What was it exactly that one did after buying groceries at the market? Wasn't there some action he had to perform now that was designed to bring to some conclusion what he could only define as a process? The car's motor with its low and persistent muttering. He searched his pockets for his cigarettes and remembered then that he needed to go home with his purchases, that that was the thing that happened next that the route he needed to travel to get home was clear, that it had been years since he quit smoking. Now here's another prose poem called Lesson, L-E-S-S-O-N, although if it resonates with L-E-S-S-E-N, that would be good. Lesson. She poured herself a glass of water. The act of retrieving the glass from the cabinet and filling it from the kitchen tap, letting the water run across two fingers until she was content with its coldness, and then holding the mouth of the glass at an angle to the silvered stream as it steadily filled, had satisfied her thirst more than if she had actually drunk from it. She set the glass down gently on the kitchen table, then just as deliberately seated herself within reach of it. The sides of the glass, tall and narrow, tinted Aegean blue, her distorted, expressionless face. She considered the glass. She considered containment, mass and volume, how they are in some ways the same and yet utterly different, Mass, the amount the glass carries, volume being the space the water occupies. And she thought suddenly and unbidden that her entire life to that moment had been spent holding grief within herself, although grieving what or for whom she knew she could never fully comprehend and that it didn't matter in any case. A gout of grieving and yet oceanic, and entirely captive within her. She dipped a finger in the water and brought it to her lips. Then she rose and, tipping the glass slowly, emptied it into the sink. Well, this poem was a guzzle, if folks know what a guzzle is. It's a form that originated in old Persia. And I don't know if I did a very good job of it, but I read the poem anyway. Guzzle of Traveling to Her. Driving in the night as the rain falls, I imagine the smell of her skin and send out a prayer that no creature, deer, moose, fox, breaks into the blossom of my headlights from out of the dark where her skin, many miles away in this darkness, against the downbeat of the wipers, breaks through the bastion of my thoughts and glides freely against my skin, a softness against a different softness, my fingertips against the curve of the road, going into the rainfall, coming in waves, the light laving the skin of the trees and stones, the leaves brightening, and then vanishing as I pass, my lips against her skin, warm, smooth, attentive, 
questioning the skin of the tires against the wet sheen of the blacktop as off to the side, just within the judgment of the headlights, a deer waits calmly, patiently, my skin tingling, suddenly alert, awakened to the captured flare of light in his eye, the clear understanding that he will wait for me to pass. Poet, her skin and its fragrance await you, again the rain, its steady caress, the bond unbroken. I'm a really big fan of um, Eastern poetry, Japanese and Chinese. Uh, I write a lot of haiku, um, and I'm a great admirer of uh, the great haiku poets, and also uh, a number of uh, the Chinese immortals, as they call them, uh, including one named Li Bai, who's often, excuse me, called Li, Li Bo or Li Po in the West. And uh, he was... Um, he was a poet who loved two things above all else, the moon and getting hammered on wine. He was a really serious drunk. But he felt, you know, that that added a lot to his, his work. So this is called Lamentation of Another Evening Wasted. This and so it's after Levi. Lamentation of another evening wasted. The wine jug has been filled and emptied, filled and emptied. My lips alone have kissed its wide, wet mouth. Leaves of torn and crumpled paper scattered about the chamber, covering my feet. An entire night of raising a cup to beg the moon's blessings, hands blackened with ink. Stain of autumn moonlight on my writing desk, stain of forsaken verses on my fingers, a night of drunken lines mourning my drunken days. One page worth saving. If I thought I could make it back to my room, I would drag my body down to the banks of the Yangtze in the awakening dawn and let this single sheet set sail on its waters under the branches of the red maples. So the book, uh, which is called A Passable Man, if people are interested in a copy and um, you'd like a signed copy, what I would ask is that you contact me directly. It came out in 2021, and uh, here are some poems from the book. This is called Boy at the Plate. I have two kids. They're both ridiculously old at this point. Uh, this is called Boy at the Plate. We're talking baseball here. Uh, the, uh, the dedication to the poem is for my children and for my parents. Boy at the plate. Spread, the boy's legs are unsteady as tent poles in a squall. It is useless to tell him I know what this is, waiting on someone who seems as near as the end of his reach to give him his chance at shame. That he hardly believes it is himself. I heard that voice in my head so many times it became a weapon the only weapon I had. It is useless to tell him the same voice splits from the throat of the field mouse, rearing up to teeth as long as its own forelegs. Useless and wrong. For now, the boy must believe he stands in the mouth of the first fear birthed in the world. Later, in time, Perhaps while watching his own and shaken by the glory of it that it is, he will see for himself the common fear, the common love he fell out of, now into, and watch, and love, and be thankful.
helping me of haiku, very short Eastern um, style, Far Eastern style poems. Uh, do, do folks know what a koan is? K O A N? A koan, as I heard one uh, Zen Buddhist describe it, is, is like when a Zen priest sort of knocks you on the forehead with a couple of words that are designed to wake you up. This poem is called Koan of a Sort. The sounds of water as she rises from her bath while I slice bread in the kitchen, how can I still feel sorry for myself? Uh, this poem was for, I wrote this poem for a, an old friend of mine. His name is Erhard Monka. Um, it was written because his father had passed away and he was having a very, very difficult time um, dealing with it. It's at this point a very old poem, but um, it's called Memento for my friend, a carpenter whose father has died. For Earhart. When you are in your car driving the darkening road, and the sadness strikes you. When the lost face rises from the shatterings of rain that uncoil a pale longing across your path. When you are eating your cold lunch by the half-finished houses and something leaves you and you take up the handle of the hammer and close your grip on it slowly, slowly. When in a moment there is the sea change, a draining of blood salt that harrows your eyes to fire and water and your cupped hands await something that never comes. Remember, do not ever forget that the road you take is taking you under the quavering stars, that the rain is a thing you wear in your hair like dew crowning the trees in summer that the houses are patient, the nail is straight, the hands are in no need of waiting, that your eyes are the Father, they are of the world and are not, and their seeing bears you across the world and the water to witness what all is not lost. What is it? It's about ten to eight. Okay, I'll I'll try to I'll finish at eight o'clock. Um, it's a poem I don't read very often. Uh, it's also it's gotten to be quite old at this point, but um, I sort of feel like reading it tonight. This poem's called "The Dress." A narrow dirt road in a coastal town finds a man lying down beneath a scrub tree by the shoulder, near enough to the sea to hear its plunge and plow. The ground is hard. The man arches his back a bit and settles. Across his face and chest rests the shadow of the tree. It trembles barely, and the man, doing his best to create a more forgiving place, tries to imagine the shade and the scrub tree as something else. But the shade slipping over him lightly becomes a black dress the tree might just have stepped free of, and the breath of the sea at his ear is a lover's sleep, and then there is no helping it. The earth is too hard. Though he can't move quite yet, the man is walking, walking in himself, already down this road that leaves him now under the folds of the dress. As a poem, 
called Fishing with My Father and the Craft of Poetry. I don't think it needs a setup, really. Um, the setup is sort of in the poem. Um, Fishing with My Father and the Craft of Poetry. Hours holding the poles over the water, hours of catching nothing or not much, and throwing back what we did catch. What the hell was that about anyway? And yet today I have this patience for things that drive some people crazy, standing in line at the supermarket, waiting for some fool blowhard to stop gabbing searching for a coat button in the snow. The finely honed conviction that beneath this nothing is a deeper, richer nothing. Consecrating myself to the silence and then to what interrupts the silence. It's a poem from my very dear friend, Pat, you will know this name, uh, Danny Seidenberg. Um, it's called Dancing Down Broadway with My Bottle of Brandy. And it's in two parts. We number dots in two. Dancing Down Broadway with My Bottle of Brandy for Danny Seidenberg. One. Sober. You continued to be repulsive. Another, she in green, senses the need you sense and pivots, pursuing an immediate elsewhere. Turns one eye to the topmost of two pulses wed at her wrist. Confirms she's history from either approach. What it is, it's, you think, too obvious. Things tend to support this conclusion in spite of your demand for little, if not nothing, from any. Then, her buttressed foot, discerned at the logical end of a last glance, falls without thought just beyond the potential glee of a fresh dog pile that squats dead center in a streetlight's wisdom. You think of vaudeville and several Eastern religions, you think life is basically stupid. You go home with this weight, fat with retreat, and break out the last bottle. Two, you skiffle on the rain-spat paving, swing the amber dancing club about your head, a warning and a benediction. Dread confines. You've finished with now you wing your way through these convenient double doors. Approach the bench. Two close-clung counselors take brief stock of their virtues. Compromise is obviously ordered. His and hers, their dewy steins announce. McNally's eyes appraise your burden. His fat finger points at your specific self. He smiles. The joint's just closed, he says, as far as you're concerned. The chatter dims. If nothing else, you've learned when you're not wanted. Your teeth by the girl's feet you envisage a matched set of pearls, broken and scattered in some jug room fray. Your company in hand, the true way. That's that. Back in the street, the rain dies quietly, an old pain sparks. Two men waiting for a bus. A drunk snores in his swollen clothes. The obvious again speaking, that rough, unquiet diamond. And of the other, of love, there is never, never enough. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap up. Um, there's a poem about childhood. And a poem about lost 
Probably that lost love would be about not not the current focus of the lyricism. This is called fill up. Lulled, he sits, a nothing in the vast back seat, amid the drumming of the gasoline, the stunned smell of worn felt and marbles. Two heedless growths perch on their collared stems, murmur the day and will not turn. Between them, the air bends out above the hood the way a snake sends itself across the surface of a lake. He studies his debased reflection in the chrome plate of an ashtray mounted damaged at the center of his parents' seat before him. Golf. He slowly leans into that face. It swells, narrows, and runs down the cracked silver. One voice enlarges, saying, Watch it, honey, or you're going to be replaced. A laugh. A cough. They are always almost there. Where are they taking him? How could I, waiting for whatever was to happen, to happen? How could I not see where they were taking him? Um... I'll finish with two poems. One is called Field in Winter. There are actually a lot of like busted relationship poems in, in the book. Um, and this is one of them. Field in Winter. I had thought what a poor thing it was to have loved and lost. Yet in some part of me, I am wishing him well, the man in your bed tonight, the care of your happiness now entrusted to him. And the tracks of the snow, they mark both distances from and to. The new snow will come. What happens then, any child knows. No evidence of our passing. And I'll finish with a poem called To March. Uh, this is a, I mean, there's certainly a lot of Omaha poems, but th I mean, this is a real, every, we all know what March is like, what the spring is like in Vermont. And um, this poem takes a lot of its imagery and energy from the month of March in New England. Um, and we could have an open mic or do whatever we whatever we want to march. And thank you very much for your very patient concentration and listening. To march, cutting carrots for soup, I'm distracted by the trees outside the window, their branches making sweeping gestures through pale air half an hour before sundown, officious, yet somehow disinterested, the somber limbs directing urging us to move more quickly past the scene of some disaster or other and go about our business. And I think, that's March, isn't it? They stand, the trees, above cracked plates of snow that look like a pile of slate shingles just tumbled off a truck and spilled around the trunks in shards. But that's March, too the declining sunlight suddenly flaring up across a glaze of ice that appears without warning at a bend in the road, this unavoidable fact about yourself and the moment, and you realize as you turn the steering wheel smoothly into the skid that you are at ease with the prospect of any possibility. Everything in the bed shifts as you hit dry pavement and then goes cascading. The whole load thunders overboard, but you've stopped, stopped. Somehow you're on all four tires, 
And when you climb out of the cab, there is the wind, that storied, oft venerated wind, moaning and clawing at your throat, a lover who wants you or wants you dead. Maybe both. Probably both, I think. Looking across the snow crust, gathering murk as dusk settles in, winter each day just a bit more distant, each day itself just a bit longer and brighter than the last, in return to the comfortable heft of the knife, the kitchen sweetened by steaming broth and promise, another seeming catastrophe survived. Thanks, folks. Thank you.